I wanted to dedicate this discussion series to talking about shifts that have recently been taking place in the South African art world. So there seems to be a breaking down of previous trends and patterns in collecting. The art world in some ways, and Chloe and I have been discussing a lot of the word, has become less static. Um, and we'd really like to explore this concept in more detail during today's discussion. We thought it'd be interesting to have three different perspectives to shed light on different aspects of the art world. So I thought that if we come to the South African art world from different angles, so for example, I come from a more theoretical background as an art historian, who then entered the secondary art market where I worked for Strauss and Co Auction House um, until the beginning of last year. And I've had a lot of exposure to collectors. Whether Nabia Muhammad is a contemporary artist based in Cape Town and Chloe Reed is an artist and curator based in Johannesburg. So we wanted to discuss this topic of how has the art world shifted over the past several weeks in particular, given the current circumstances of lockdown in South Africa. Now we can analyze these shifts to both the artist and the collector with a viewpoint from the artist themselves. Chloe as a curator brings in an additional perspective from the primary art market, and I'd like to contribute with my experience from the secondary art market. So just as an introduction before we start, uh, Chloe Reed is from Johannesburg, studied at Michaelis, and then went on to study at Glasgow School of Art in Scotland, and she came back last year after a year-long fellowship at the Glasgow Sculpture Studios during 2018. And she's exhibited and curated locally and internationally. And last year, she established Gallery Gallery with the aim of developing an embodied framework for artists, writers, and curators that basically foregrounds collaboration and exchange. So I was very interested in contacting Chloe because of her multidisciplined approach to the art world. I'm also very excited that Nabia, Nabia Muhammad can be here with us today. She's an artist from Cape Town, who also studied at Michaelis, and she's exhibited locally and internationally and is represented in South Africa by Smith Studio. And I was interested, I was very interested to have her into our discussion because I've heard a lot about her from some of the art collectors I've already worked with who have mentioned how excited they are about her work. And she's an artist who's very present online and active on social media and in particular Instagram, which is something I wanted to talk to, wanted to talk about today. So thanks to Chloe and Nibia for joining us today. Um, and maybe just to start, I'd like to ask you, Chloe, to elaborate on your moving between different roles in the art world, maybe to define some of those roles for us. Sure. Um, so I work as, as an artist, um, producing my own work, and um, I also work as a curator, which I actually see as a kind of extension of my practice as an artist. Um, and I also consult for a company called Art Gazette, um, which purchases work um, directly from artists. It's an online catalogue um, for contemporary art. And they, um, they play quite a unique role in the art world. It's a very new company. Um, and I think maybe I'll speak a little bit more about Art Gazette later in the conversation. Um, but yeah, those roles, um, sometimes they overlap, certainly. Um, so as, as an artist, I work uh, in a number of different mediums um, and my interest in, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I work in um, film, writing, um, I'm a printmaker, I've recently done quite a lot of painting, um, I've also worked with audio um, and, and I write um, short fiction. And um, I think probably the most kind of consistent uh, theme in, in all of, between all of those mediums is, um, is a kind of visual or textual looping um, or kind of ideas of repetition and looking for, um, looking for patterns um, in kind of everyday human behavior um, through that kind of looping. Um, yeah. Then as a curator, I, I became interested in curating quite recently. Um, it was it was a surprise to me because I'd always seen curating as um, kind of an accessory to to artistic practice rather than something that is that can be very I mean it's it's very mm. broad and people work in so many different ways. Um, that's that's interesting. I think like you and I are on the, either end of that spectrum. But yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, so yeah, I kind of fell into it rather than looking for it. Um, and it, it, I became interested in, in the way work is experienced. Initially, my own work, so trying to kind of control um, or condition the way in which um, the audience receives the work. So not just thinking about kind of dropping your work off at the gallery and then disappearing, kind of thinking, well, how, how does a person experience this work? So that came through kind of uh, exhibiting my own work and then, and then I became interested in working with other artists. And uh, I think what curating, sorry? Oh, sorry. Just that's an interesting that's an interesting point that you raise there as an artist that you say as you just drop off your artworks. Is the curation process something that an artist, maybe Nabia, you'd like to comment on this? Is that something that you're very involved with? How your artworks are curated within the gallery space? I mean, I think that that really depends on what in what framework it exists. So something with like a group show, um, if I if I'm talking about like exhibiting in yeah in a gallery space, and then like a group show, I don't have much control over that kind of thing. Um, I did certainly think that how a show is curated, like if I'm showing in, in a solo exhibition, um, yeah, I would have I'd like to have a big say in how work, um, how the conversation is started from the first piece to the last, or um, yeah. Um, but I must say that I have had. A uh, good experience with my the team at Smith in terms of assistance with curating. I do think it takes a special, it takes a different kind of mind to really curate something well. And that's also interesting. Sorry, another point you just raised, Chloe, that I'd like to elaborate a little bit on is that that interesting crossover from artist to curator. So. For maybe for our listeners that don't understand the difference between the primary and the secondary art market, maybe you can just explain to them what the primary art market is. Um. <laughs> I mean, just sure. No, I can. I mean, I can talk um, <laughs> about uh, what I think that is. I think in South Africa, yeah, I, I think it differs from place to place. Um, and my experience of the primary market has been different in, I mean, I've lived in South Africa and I've lived in Scotland and they've, they, well, in Johannesburg and Glasgow specifically and have very different art scenes. Um, but in South Africa, I would say the primary art market includes um, exhibition making through galleries mainly. Um, and, I, and we do have obviously a few um, public galleries and, and a few museums as well. Um, but the yeah. way that art, art is shown here and, and sold is generally through that, those platforms. Um, so yeah, so, uh, um, and in, I suppose there aren't really that many other, and, and part of why this conversation is interesting is that, um, and, an, and another area, the reason I also got into curating, I think is, um, is to find different ways of showing work that there isn't just kind of one at you you was you use the word static olivia um there isn't one kind of static way of showing that there are multiple ways of showing work and i think i think what this um this time this lockdown time has kind of it's pushed a lot of us to think about different ways of, of showing work um and i think you know i think there's something that um about exhibiting in a gallery in a sort of established space um that is really useful for an artist it's it's you know beyond obviously um providing a platform for sales it's um if you have you're, you're kind of working towards a solo exhibition it offers this space to create kind of resolution in your work so to produce a series of works and get some kind of idea come to a point in your work um because you're you're given a date and you're given a space and a time and you you have to kind of present a thesis of what you're working on. And it's not to say that um, it's resolved, because often it isn't, but it, it forces you to kind of present your work um, and try and kind of uh, reflect on it and try and understand what you're doing in a very kind of tidy, organized way. And, and as Nabia was saying, that kind of input, that objective input you get from curators um, is really valuable because it's, it's someone coming in and looking at what often as an artist you kind of you're you're really stuck in the work you can't see what you're doing actually you need someone to come in take the work and kind of lay it out for you 
and say, this is what I think. And ideally, as kind of Nabia was saying, then you say, well, actually, this is, I agree with this and I, you know, so it's a, yeah. So, so that's, I suppose, what I, what I think of as the primary. And that, and that sorry, also involves art fairs, um, which are a kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe Olivia. Another maybe. platform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of. You used an interesting term, plat a platform for sale. Because as you said, as the artist, you two are very much involved with the creation of the actual work. Mm -hmm. And then it almost transforms to the first platform of sales, if you'd like, which is the primary market, which is the gallery or the art fair. So this is where artists have a direct link to the, their first sale, the, the first time their artwork is being sold. And then I come from the secondary art market, which is where an artwork is coming from one collector to another. Um, it's the resale of objects that almost exclude artists entirely. So it's that, that whole transition, the whole, the movement and life and history, if you like, of an artwork is actually, is a really interesting one. But I like that term that you use, a, a platform for sale. But I think a gallery can be a lot more than that, as you were saying. It can be it, the space that lends itself to the artwork. Um, so, Nibia, I don't know if you maybe would like to maybe talk a bit about um, your practice as an artist and how and where you exhibit your work. Yeah, um, I'd actually like to comment a little bit about um, yeah that that connection to collectors. It's funny that you said something about um, uh, the secondary market being collector to collector, which, ex which excludes the artist. I almost feel like in the primary, uh, once you're selling work in a gallery, you often I, I didn't realize realize this until I started working with a gallery that I wouldn't know where a lot of my work would be going to. Um, mm. I don't really know where a lot of the work exists currently. It kind of just goes directly from the gallery into someone's home. And mm. I often don't know the name of the owners. Um, and I've actually, I've missed that um, quite a bit. Before I was uh, working with Smith, I would sell a lot of work um, on my, through my Instagram um, account. And then I was obviously directly, I would have direct interaction with the, the buyers. Um, what's been interesting now during the lockdown is that I started selling a little bit of more experimental work again um, through Instagram once again. And it's kind of introduced me to a new group. Well, not new, but yeah, some, some new and younger collectors because I'm also selling the work at slightly more affordable price prices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's just, I, I'm enjoying the, the interaction again is what the interaction with collectors. Yes, yeah, it's a little personal. Um, and I mean, I'm thinking now about something, uh, Candace Marshall, who owns Smith, she's recently been doing, um, during lockdown, sharing some of the uh, the works that she owns in her house and explaining like what they mean to her, what the works mean to her, why she bought them. Um, oh. Yeah, it's been quite a, um, it's, it's been a treat to read every day what she's been putting up and, I think that I'd love to know why some people have collected some of the pieces that I've made and what they think of it or their, their interpretations of the work. Mm. It's interesting how you talk about a relationship between artist and collector. And that's really what I wanted to get into today. Because from my experience, having worked a lot with collectors, there are certain collectors who are very interested in knowing the history behind the work. They actually want the input from the artist. They want to know why the artwork was painted the way it was, what it represents. They, they really would like to attach the artwork to the artist themselves. And on the secondary art markets before, obviously we sell, you know, Strauss and Company and a lot of the auction houses, they sell South African masters, you know, painters that are no longer alive. And as a result, there was no, there's no connection between the artist and the work. So buying an artwork, is, it's, not a, it's not a question of getting to know the artist. Mm -hmm. But with the shift towards contemporary South African art, which has come up more and more, you know, within, you know, amongst collectors in this country in the last sort of two, three years, the artists are alive and practicing. 
So there's that whole other dimension now that can come into the works, which, which is really interesting. Um, so, Nabia, can you tell us a little bit, what sort of, how do you, how do you reach collectors? What sort of platforms do you use to get your work out there besides um, the gallery? Um, well, I would say that Instagram is the, the main way that I'm, I'm connecting to new collectors. Um, I've also had recently, it was, it's, I've had very nice exposure through um, a gallery that I started working with very recently, a Dutch-based gallery called Nederland, who was supposed to be showing some of my work at the 154 leg of, New, what, the New York leg of 154, uh, which is the Contemporary Art, African Art Fair. Um, it was supposed to happen in May, but obviously was cancelled due to uh, the pandemic. So they took everything, the entire fair online, um, on Artsy, and they presented it quite beautifully there. And I think to encourage engagement, uh, they've been doing little collector's picks videos uh, where you, yeah, they invite a collector to come talk about five or six different artists from, um, from the fair that they, whose work they, they're interested in. And um, I've been very lucky to be included in two of those collector's picks. Um, so I've had a lot of nice exposure there but um, yeah, other than that, it's really just Instagram that I have any kind of personal control over. Okay. And that's just because you mentioned the pandemic, that's also another very interesting discussion is that I have been very interested in shifts that have been taking place in the South African art, you know, the art market recently. And obviously with the pandemic in the last few weeks, we've seen a radical shift in the way art people are able to produce and sell work during lockdown. So have you been based in Cape Town during the lockdown and what sort of artist initiatives or how have you been able to practice as a during lockdown? Um, I must say that, I mean, in the first couple of weeks, it was quite nice. There was quite, uh, I found my work practice to have quite a lot of focus, uh, but that's also because they were based on, I had like short term projects that I could work towards. Um, and mostly the first couple of weeks when I was involved in a lot of little fundraising initiatives. Um, one that was organized, by, or one that was called the Do Nation Fundraiser, which is for people, fundraising for people most affected by the pandemic. Um, Clark's Bookshop is also currently running an auction, um, trying to raise funds for their staff. Um, it's currently live, so I would definitely recommend collectors checking that out. Uh, and then also I've been involved in a, um, a project initiated by a friend of mine who's also an artist, Chris Grunewald, who started something called Corona Commissions. He essentially start, he was inviting people to send, their, send portraits, uh, pictures of himself to him, which he would do a drawing of in exchange for a 580 Rand donation towards Corona Care. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's been an incredible um, initiative and I think it's grown quite phenomenally. Um, but now artists are sending, setting their own parameters, uh, which mm -hmm. is quite nice. So for example, I was doing, I invited um, kind of five slots. It was, I find commissions quite daunting and kind of nerve wracking. So I, I allotted kind of five slots and then said that people could opt for either an A5 work for 500 Rand or a, a4 work for a thousand rand. And I chose um, a different uh, charity to give towards. Um, so yeah, it, I think that it, that was a nice little project to do. Um, I'm trying to think of then. And then other works, I've mostly been working on smaller pieces. Um, I don't have access to a full studio at the moment. So a lot of works on paper. Um, and again, the collage series, which has been quite a new experimental um, venture for me. And Chloe, you're based in Johannesburg, and I know you're part of a much larger connection um, network of artists. Um, how have you been finding being able to produce work during lockdown? Um, yeah. Um, it's been an interesting time for me um, because I, uh, because I'm involved in kind of 
uh, a lot of different things and I move between kind of different fields. Um, I haven't found that much time to produce work or the works that I have produced in the past sort of year um, have been kind of large scale uh, commission work that I produce very slowly. So, um, so lockdown is actually, because of quite a few of the other projects I was working on have fallen away or not been kind of viable during lockdown um, or adapted in some way. Um, mm. I've, uh, yeah, it gave me, I suppose, like Nabia was saying, gave me a lot of focus and I've actually produced a huge amount of work, um, well, by my standards in the lockdown period. And that's, that's been great actually. And I think kind of, um, because I do kind of work as a curator and also um, I purchase work for Art Gazette, um, I've had exposure to a lot of the different ways that artists are kind of handling lockdown and how it's affecting their practice. And um, and I think, yeah, there, there are a lot of things about that that are interesting to me. And one of them um, is, I suppose, kind of tying into what Nabia was saying is these kind of initiatives going on between linking different artists and um, because I'm kind of part of a network in the UK and specifically in Scotland um, I've had a kind of view to uh, the kind of initiatives that have been going on there between artists um, and and here as well and I think that kind of community um, that, that community sort of artists working communally that's a really, really nice thing that has come out of this. Um, I think because a lot of um, a lot of artists work through kind of galleries, um, the, the focus in, in South Africa and in working in that way is on your individual practice and it can be quite a solitary thing. And I think in the same way as Instagram is collecting, is connecting artists with buyers in, in a new way. So are artists actually connecting with other artists um, and I know in the UK and actually globally, there's been an, an initiative called Artist Support Pledge, which I'm sure most people have, have seen. Um, and that's where artists are actually kind of mostly pledging to purchase one another's work. And once you get to a certain threshold, um, and, and the prices are kind of reasonable, um, and once you get to a certain threshold, of, then you commit to buying another artist's work. So it's this kind of cycle that's really interesting and really productive. Um, and I've been interested to see, and I had a few conversations about how and why Artist Support Pledge hasn't caught on in South Africa. And um, for me, I think that's because uh, because there have been a lot of other kind of, um, in some ways, more interesting initiatives going on, like those Corona commissions that Nabia was talking about, kind of groups of artists who've got together and started doing things um, that aren't quite as generalized and ideally will survive beyond the lockdown so they're not kind of relying on um saying well you know this is a difficult time for artists or it's a difficult you know that they're raising money for charities um they're actually kind of developing new ways of showing and new ways of selling um but yeah i think in terms of how different artists are producing uh it's for a lot of people it comes it, it, it's sort of up and down um i think for some people it's been it's provided a this kind of gap uh, where they can actually think and reflect on their practice, which is very hard to come by if you are very much a part of the, the art world. It's, it's very demanding on an artist. You, you often will be working towards one big project, like a solo show, and then there'll be multiple fairs that you have to produce work for. So it's kind of like a treadmill. And because a lot of those things have been suspended, um, it's offered the opportunity for some artists to actually step back and maybe stop producing for a little while and think about what they're doing. Um, and I think that's a very productive thing. Um, and then for other artists, it's been a case of, well, you know, uh, a lot of artists live kind of month to month, um, or rather just to say, you know, that things are kind of unstable for a lot of artists. You, you don't, you might make a lot of sales one month and nothing the next month. So, um, so that kind of pressure has been quite good for a few people's practice. They've had to kind of rally their resources and resources are another thing you know uh, uh, i mean i ran out of paper in the first week of um of lockdown and uh yeah, the, the, logistics, the logistics of lockdown when we thought it was only going to be an initial 21 days must have affected you know all the art shops have, art, art shops have been closed so that must have affected exactly. yeah and there, there are two interesting things that have come out of that for me and the one is and, and that's in terms of my own practice and other people's um or other artists who, who I work with. 
um, is people have been kind of, I mean, I know Will Nabia mentioned her kind of collages that she's working on. And I don't know if this has come out of that necessarily, but she's been kind of um, cutting up previous works um, that she felt were kind of less successful in creating these um, incredible collages out of them. And, uh, and then another thing that has come out, so you're kind of working with what you have available, um, mm -hmm. which is often quite a productive challenge. It's good to be pushed into a new way of working. Um, and, and then in terms of kind of resources and materials, um, I'm part of a, a kind of a, it's just a big WhatsApp group basically of artists in Johannesburg. I think there are about 250 people on it. And, you know, as kind of uh, the, uh, the sort of, what, 21 days, as, as we got sort of to the end of that, people started saying, well, does anyone have a, a tube of titanium white um, oil paint? And, and then you go and do a kind of drop off. And there was this very nice, <laughs> this very, or does anyone have a certain kind of paper? And often you do, you know, you buy supplies and you don't, you, you know, you optimistic about what you will use and uh so yeah so that was quite a nice another kind of community thing that came out of this but it's almost a collaboration in itself with a yeah um so yeah that's very interesting i wonder if we'll see certain themes that you know going forward in the future and certain types of a certain way of working that we can identify later in in the work of artists that reflect this time period. It'll be interesting to see mm -hmm. how it shifts pe people's yeah, direction. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of, I mean, I'm just thinking of going back to, uh, I think the kind of main thread of the conversation, which is um, thinking about connecting artists and buyers. And um, as someone who's obviously an artist and also a buyer in, in some respects, um, and also, yeah, I suppose I, I sell work of other artists as well um it's it's interesting you know a kind of purely gallery practice is very tidy you know when you go and see an exhibition um the work and the way it's laid out it's been very um been very well thought out um and what's quite nice about platforms like instagram is that you get to see we're seeing a lot of um artists working process and mm. um and where they're working and how they're working we're seeing a lot of interviews with artists um, and I think that insight for a buyer is is great. It's it's a lot kind of messier than 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 a gallery practice. And I think I suppose what I'm saying is it's great to have both. Um, it's yeah. great to kind of have that kind of um, cleanness of a gallery. Um, yeah. And again, that kind of thesis. Um, and then it's also great to see kind of artists messing around. And um, and I think yeah. Um, I think that enables buyers to um, connect with artists also in, in a kind of unintimidating way. Mm. Um, Liz, I, think, I think what's nice about that sort of the Instagram space is that there's something that feels yeah, more intimate and authentic about how you're looking at the work there um, mm. as opposed to a perfect white cube gallery space. Um, yeah. It's interesting because um, just talking about collectors, I've seen there's definitely been a shift in the way collectors have been buying art, I think, over the last few years. And um, Curate, we actually held our first discussion series about three weeks ago where we were joined by Kirsty College, who's head of paintings department at Strauss & Co in Cape Town. And we talked about how the last kind of two, three years globally, um, but in South Africa has seen a movement, kind of a willingness, almost a preference these days for art collectors to purchase art online. Um, you know, sort of a boom in online sales and Sotheby's Christie's and obviously at Strauss. And more recently during lockdown, um, we've seen the lack of physical interaction obviously between artists and collectors the inability for collectors to visit galleries go to openings physically attend art fairs talk to artists it's basically forced um collectors onto the internet themselves to start exploring platforms like instagram and the internet to find artists and on the other end of the spectrum it's you know an artist now has had open themselves up to having a presence on the internet 
Um, so it's almost as if there was a movement towards this before, but the pandemic has really forced the art, the art world onto the internet. And the internet has, in a way, opened up the art world and made it more accessible. Olivia, um, can I ask you a question um, from my side? Is that Do you think that that change has also got to do with a shift in who your buyer is? As in, like, it's a generational thing. So perhaps because you're having a younger set of, of buyers, maybe they are already that much more interactive online than say mm -hmm. you're old. Yeah. Definitely. And we analyzed this um, with Kirsty as well, where she looked at a lot of the stats behind the ages of their collectors and how sort of uh, collectors in their 30s and 40s have really gone up exponentially in the last two, three years. Whereas before, collectors were maybe in their 60s. And yeah. I think that's to do also with the shift towards contemporary art. So with um, more hype and more interest in contemporary art, it's attracting also younger collectors who can relate maybe a little bit more to some of the contemporary art. And so definitely there is a younger and younger audience that is willing to collect. Of the collectors that we work with at Curate, a lot of them are, are young collectors in their 30s um, who are very excited about buying art um, and buying a lot of art and building big collections, definitely. That's super exciting to hear from an artist's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so just to go back to Instagram, and talking about how um, how the internet has opened up the art world recently. Do you feel like you had the same internet presence before and during lockdown? Or have you really seen that shift where artists have had to force themselves onto the internet? Uh, is this for Chloe or just, I suppose, for you? <laughs> yeah, maybe you'd like to start, Nabia. Um, I must say, for me personally, I think I've been quite active on Instagram uh, for quite a while now. So um, I do see a change, though, in a lot of other artists who maybe have started. It's almost that like I've seen artists who've used this time and Instagram as a commitment to themselves to like maybe do something every day. Um, I know that I think there's, um, an, I think the artist Alice Toysh has start, started like a 21 day uh, lockdown art a day kind of challenge. But that was sort of for, was, was open to anyone to do. And she would sort of set these challenges like uh, paint your, the view that you see every day. Um, or, so I guess, yes, I've, uh, I think people have been uh, more active and um, it's been a way to, uh, yeah, get, them, get themselves, making stuff every day. And Chloe, I know you um, may be less enthusiastic about having a huge uh, Instagram presence. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, uh, for my own kind of practice, I am um, not the most talented on Instagram. I, I use it for Gallery Gallery, which is the kind of, um, I suppose, the platform through which I do most of my collaborative and curatorial work. Um, and uh, I, I find Instagram a, a really, um, I think it's a great platform. It's kind of um, got quite, uh, I suppose the aesthetic is, is quite sort of straightforward. It's just a grid and you can fill that grid in any way you can, uh, in any way you want. Um, and it doesn't sort of impose a very specific design aesthetic on you as kind of other platforms do. Or if, if you're working through a website, um, you've got to think quite hard about layout. With Instagram, it's just, it's a, it's a grid. Um, and you've got to fit kind of your work or your ideas into that. Um, and I like that aspect of it. But um, I suppose Instagram over the lockdown period and before, um, the, the changes that I have seen are really through my work with Art Gazette. Um, and, and just to kind of give you a, 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 an idea of what Art Gazette is, it is quite a unique model. And there isn't, to my knowledge, uh, anything really that like it out there at the moment. Um, and what Art Gazette does is they um, they provide curated collections of artwork, um, so full large collections of artwork to private and public spaces who are looking for 
um, a creative kind of a creative solution. Um, so that could be co-working spaces um, who want in contemporary art um, rather than kind of a series of posters or kind of um, a more kind of standard form of decor. Um, and and what Art Gazette does is that they purchase works directly from artists um, in, in large quantities. So often they'll buy kind of 10 works at a time. And those works are not the same works that an artist might um, might show in a gallery context. They are experimental works, they're studies. Um, often the work is very different to um, an artist's kind of core practice. And what it offers artists is, um, obviously the work is not bought, it's not on commission. So the work is bought upfront. Um, and again, in large quantities. And then, it, and it offers artists a kind of um, basic monthly income. So if you offer work to Art Gazette, every month, um, you can get a kind of basic income that then supports your larger, more ambitious gallery practice. Um, and it can also be a nice space for experimentation. So it's not, it's not an online gallery, it's not kind of um, a platform to show your work. Um, it's a kind of, um, I suppose, a relationship with, um, with collectors in some ways. It's, it's um, yeah, uh, so, so anyway, and one of the main ways that we source artists um, to um, it is through Instagram. And, um, and it's not the only way. So it's kind of one part of it. So when I am kind of looking for, um, there's, there's a group of us curators or associate curators who work for Art Gazette um, all over the world. And um, we'll look to Instagram and different, um, different kind of galleries or platforms on Instagram for different artists. And that'll be the starting point quite often. So you'll see an artist's work and um, and you'll kind of follow it up, have a look at it, possibly share it with someone else from the team, say, what do you think of this? Um, and then move on to their website and then possibly move on to, uh, I suppose, a little bit more thorough research into their practice and then possibly contacting them and, um, and not, you know, that's just still the beginning, you know, then you'll request a kind of a catalog of works potentially. So it's, it's not, the only platform that you're using, but it's it's definitely a way in, and I think that's where Instagram is really valuable. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a really great access point, and it's informal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You brought up quite an interesting point, Chloe. Thanks. I'd like to just elaborate on when you talked about, and this is a concept that um, we've often had to explain to collectors about the core body of an artist's work versus more experimental works and i don't know if you'd like to just elaborate a little bit on this for some of our listeners how different works how an artist can produce different types of works um yeah it's it's i think it's another thing that has come out of come out of this and again going back to navia's collages um it's kind of because instagram is quite an, an informal and a loose platform um, it does provide a space to offer work possibly at lower prices than what you would sell elsewhere. Um, and the same is true for Art Gazette. Um, and to actually play around with things. Again, kind of when you put a work on an art fair, um, and I can really, you know, this is mostly from my own experience or, or into a gallery. Um, again, there's a kind of resolve to it um, that, uh, I suppose doesn't necessarily further the work, um, whereas, um, and, and not to say that it's not productive, but it, I, I suppose there's more of a finish to work that you would display on those platforms, more of a certainty in what you're doing. Um, and again, uh, this is kind of a generalization because there are artists who very much play within that gallery space. Um, but it depends how you work, but. Um, but yeah, I think um, more experimental work might be, say, well, a good example on Art Gazette is um, uh, Daniela Mooney, who has a, um, a very kind of, um, her core practice is kind of very thoroughly researched, um, very labored, um, very detailed sculptural practice. Mm -hmm. um, but for Art Gazette, and also actually, she's an interesting one for Instagram. On her Instagram account, she has an Instagram account that's separate from her main one. 
that is called Thinking Like a Mountain. And, and it's all paintings of mountains. Um, oh. And she's, she's a very avid, uh, actually one of her works, one of them is featured on the, on the, um, on the PowerPoint. Um, but she's, she loves hiking. And she also happens to be an incredible painter. And uh, she paints these very kind of loose um, kind of, she plays with light there and color and texture and tries to capture the atmosphere of these, these mountains that she climbs <laughs> or hikes or um, hikes up. And, uh, and it's so very different to her kind of main, I would say gallery oriented practice. And she, she does practice in many different ways, but that's, um, yeah, that's quite an, a good example, I would say. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that sort of helps. No, yes, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, from a more, from an artist's point of view, I'm almost, almost constantly looking to define an artist's whole body of work to understand that. And then it's always interesting to see later on in the career, the kind of outlying artworks, mm. you know, experimental phases, that don't really, sh that didn't fit into the core body of work that was sort of outliers. And then later on down the line, when you sell a work, let's say on auction, long after the death of an artist to elaborate on those different phases and you know where, where the artwork fits in to the, the artist production. So that's, yeah. that's a point that a lot of people don't realize. They probably yeah. don't really and that, that experimentation, I mean, sometimes, yeah, I suppose it produces these kind of outliers, but other, other times it, it actually pushes the practice in new directions. Yes. So, um, so in the beginning, it might, a kind of more experimental work might come out of nowhere. And either for yourself as an artist or myself as an artist or looking at another artist's work, I kind of think, well, where's this going? I can't, um, it's not coherent um, with kind of the, the rest of the artist's practice and, um, and it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of work for it to suddenly get to a point where it starts to make sense within the broader practice. And you need mm. to kind of work through those experimental phases and those experimental works. They kind of, sometimes that can then turn into your practice. Um, mm. But um, it's somehow, it's a way of working that's less pressured. And sometimes you have to be in certain circumstances in order to, to work in that way. I know I, well, lockdown has done that for me, a kind of pressure to, to produce, to make work, to start selling work. Um, uh, yeah, and it's uh, so, yeah, it's interesting. And I guess as an artist, it's it's a difficult balance if you work full time as an artist between your what you your artistic um, desires to produce and your awareness of what maybe the market wants or what collectors want or what your gallery is asking for. Yeah, I think that what can happen is um, oftentimes the, the work that you produce are bodies of work, there's pressures. The pressure to produce a cohesive body of work comes more from um, the buyers or gallery side than what an artist's real desires are. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think it's, What's nice to have, why it's nice to have different platforms to sell through is that it allows you that experiment, experimentation and play um, that otherwise might not be acceptable because you, ha you have to, your work is understood in a certain framework and um, to like diverge from that is like worrying to your gallery or <laughs> to, a, to potential buyers. So, and Nabia, you had your first solo exhibition with Smith earlier this year in February? Yes, um, it closed actually just prior to lockdown. Um, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. Would you like me to t talk about the, the show? I was just interested in um, how much time you get to prep for your solo show, because there must be a lot of pressure to, to get that body of work together for a solo, for a solo um, show. Um, so initially when Jana, the curator, uh, Jana Tablanche is the curator at Smith, when we first talked about doing the solo, it, um, it was, a, we had the option of doing it in October last year, October of 2019 versus Feb of 2020. Feb 2020 gave me a, just over a year to produce the body of work and I opted for that. I, I wanted the time to be able to make a lot of work and then be able to edit out pieces I didn't feel, um, worked well with the show. 
Um, so yes, it was about a year, just over a year in the making um, with fairs and other group shows that came in between. Okay, great. Well, I, and if anyone has any questions, I don't know if Chloe or Nobia, you have any questions for me? Or if you would like to open up the panel for any questions, I'm happy to do that. If anyone having listened to the discussion didn't understand anything, we'll open up for questions. I'm happy to open up for questions. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I, I would, um, I do have a little bit of a question, which I, you have spoken about a little bit already, but um, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in this kind of idea of collectors and kind of how they, I mean, the, the collectors I know kind of, um, I want to say they like artists, but they're as varied in their practices as artists are in, in my kind of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and they buy work for quite different reasons. Um, and so I, from you, I suppose I'm quite interested in knowing or hearing about kind of the younger collectors who you're working with, kind of what, um, what they're interested in, what they're looking for, how they, how they look for work, if they tend to be, feel safer, um, going through galleries or, um, or consulting kind of a specialist. Um, I mean, I suppose Nabia and I both have our experience with kind of collectors in our kind of own way and the different ways in which they work. Um, but yeah, I suppose I'd like maybe for you to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, I mean, that's very interesting. I think I've seen generally a shift, you know, with Curate were a platform um, that helps collectors basically manage their collections. Um, so we have a lot of different types of collectors that, that we engage with. And for the younger collectors, I would say that there is, um, they, a lot of them do purchase from the galleries because they trust the taste of the galleries. So a lot of collectors feel overwhelmed when they enter the art world because they feel like they don't know what to buy and they don't judge, they, can't, they don't like to choose for themselves. Sometimes they're fearful in the beginning to do so. So they like galleries to kind of explain to them. Um, you know, so I've noticed that some of the older, more mature collectors have always been used to buying through auction houses and galleries, you know, and seeking out advice from, from experts before purchasing. But I have noticed that there is a wave of younger art of younger collectors um, who do have, you know, extra income to spend on, on art and are very keen to buy and build up big collections. And they're actually buying what they love for no other reason than they just love the work. Mm -hmm. So whether they see it in a gallery or they see it on Instagram or one of their friends shows them a picture. Um, so more and more I've met collectors who sort of met artists at their, you know, at Michaela's grad show, at their sort of graduate shows or their very first exhibitions, but somehow just loved the work and connected with the artist. And yes, I've definitely noticed a stronger relationship developing between younger collectors and contemporary artists. So they know each other, they're getting to know each other, they're, there's an interaction happening between that. So that's definitely what I've seen more of in the space now where I'm, we're no lo I'm no longer formally with, you know, st stuck in the secondary art market. I'm seeing a lot more diversity in the collectors, and it is very interesting. Um, some collectors are interested in, in buying art, not just because they love it, but for investment reasons. That still plays quite an important role. And at Curate, we do a lot of analysis of the art market. And we, could, we do that because there's a market for it. There's a market for people, for collectors, wanting to know the value of their collection. Mm -hmm. They want to buy art because they love it, but they also don't want to lose millions and millions of brands doing so. So they're aware of, of, of monitoring the market. Mm -hmm. 
So those that also goes hand in hand. Some collectors are aware of that as well, definitely. So very different reasons and very different types of collectors out there, I would say. I think we um, had a question. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, we just had a question. Can you recommend good Instagram sites as a platform for young artists? You mentioned Art Gazette. Um, I'm happy to answer answer that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, I think Art Gazette is very actively purchasing work from artists all over the world at the moment. So um, I think that is a good, a, an interesting platform to look at. Um, and I suppose the way that I kind of look at and look for artists, um, and again, I, I kind of very much stress that that's, it's kind of the beginning of the process. It's where you start and then often the website will be there and you'll go there and then you'll kind of talk to people about it. And, you know, it's a whole kind of, holistic um, way of looking and finding out about artists, um, particularly if you're, if you're wanting to purchase something for, you know, you are thinking about the long-term value of it. Um, you want to know about an artist kind of full practice. Have they exhibited? Where have they exhibited? Or are they, do they work in a different way to that? Do they work kind of, um, but yeah, so kind of starting point for me is I will follow, I follow most of the galleries and the big kind of, and the small, any galleries that, that are in South Africa, and they're quite easy to kind of find. Um, and then I will go through and see kind of different artists that they're showing, and often then I will follow those artists' personal accounts. Um, and that's great because you get a kind of, that insight into the way that that artist works. Um, and then other platforms. So in Johannesburg, spaces like the Bag Factory, so uh, sort of artist studios and that kind of thing, the Bag Factory Artist Studios, they have an Instagram account. And again, you can go through that and then find the kind of, um, uh, find the, the individual artist account. Also August House. Um, I uh, recommend following Gallery Gallery um, because we don't have a stable of artists. We work with, um, it's, I work collaboratively with lots of different artists. So there are a lot of kind of different and, and in different stages in their careers. So we've got kind of established artists and less established artists or emer uh, it's a terrible word, emerging artists. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, and then actually what happens is when you start following, go with your interest, you know, like follow the, the works and the people whose work resonates with you. And then actually the Instagram algorithm kicks in and starts showing you, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Up and you're like, oh, that's amazing. How do they know? Um, I know that we're all supposed to be scared of the Instagram algorithm, but um, as long as you take initiative, um, you know, and, and don't, uh, yeah, you, you, you maintain your own <laughs> independence <laughs> to some degree. Uh, that's, that's one, yeah. But, uh, but I think, you know, you can go with Instagram, you can go down rabbit holes, find out, Look at who the artists you like. Look at who they follow. Because yeah. I, mean, I follow artists whose work I like um, and whose work I, uh, you know, that inspires me that I use as references. Um, so, yeah, I would say follow follow broadly. And then if, if stuff starts, pop, yeah, and don't be sort of, um, uh, don't hold back because you can always unfollow someone if they start sort of spamming you with, um, you know, shameless self-promotion. Um, nothing wrong with it, really. Probably, uh, probably something I should look to a little bit further. But uh, yeah, so that that's kind of what my recommendation would be. I don't know. And um, Nabs, what would you sort of say in terms of? Um, it. Do you know what came to mind now was um, there's a platform um, that I follow called. I actually had to look it up just to make sure I'm getting the name right. It's called Two Painters, Two Paintings, um, which is it's it's. A, I don't, I'm not sure who the account is run by, but you basically it invites people, painters to have any, any way in their career to submit um, works to a certain web, to their website. And they've got quite a, I mean, I'm always introduced to new interesting artists via that, uh, this platform on Instagram. Um, and he's also, he, she, they have also started doing um, online, exhibitions where they invite a curator to um to assist them and choose like and they have a different um i want to say the word theme but somehow it's, 
a different um, kind of concept for a show and yeah, invite artists to submit work. And then they have online exhibitions, which is quite a exciting new a thing that I've seen happening quite a lot also. Okay, great. Um, and we will, we, we always type up and have the recording of the webinar, which we'll upload in the next few days onto the onto our website. So all of this information about where to who to find on Instagram will all be written up in the article. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I've got a question. Sorry, are you guys still okay with time? Yeah, we've yeah. got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, obviously now during the pandemic a lot of galleries have opened up um, exhibitions virtually and art fairs are all happening online do you guys think that post um, the pandemic things like that will continue so that some art fairs would maybe purely move to online or some galleries would main would only be online and maybe host a few pop-up exhibitions or things like that and that they that, that there'll be a shift in um, in how we experience and view art? Uh, yeah, or do you think it's kind of gonna just go back to the way that it was? Um, Let me think Chloe and Olivia can answer then, me. I don't know if I've got that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, I have to say from my side, I um, the kind of physical experience of an artwork and an exhibition is very mm. important to me. Yeah. Um, and it's something I really miss. Um, and uh, and that goes for a lot of different things. I think that's that's kind of being in a space and overhearing, if, if your own work is on show, it's overhearing someone saying something about it um, mm. that might be quite amusing or mean, possibly, which is always valuable. Um, and, uh, or, or, you know, if, if at a, at a, you know, um, from a kind of curatorial point of view or, or just being a viewer or a buyer, kind of, meeting the artist potentially and having a discussion in front of the work, looking at the work while you talk about it, um, I think it's very important. But I think that um, that applies differently to different forms of, of art. I mean, I know um, lockdown has been quite amazing for, for video art. There's, there is um, mm -hmm. there's moving image work being shared globally. And often it's very hard to access those films um, because I suppose, um, well, to my knowledge, the art world still hasn't worked out how to kind of coherently or um, reliably um, monetize or value video work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what lockdown has done is just said, well, we, we can it's created relationships between different um, different galleries. I know that there's a program that the National Gallery in Cape Town is involved in with, I think, Whitechapel Gallery and, and several different galleries around the world who oh, cool. are sharing works from their collections online and you can watch those videos so i think for different artworks it's kind of having a different kind of an effect um that, that's a great thing as far as i'm concerned um i do know that quite a lot of galleries are adapting the way that they work um to to suit kind of what i suppose we imagine will be the new normal so i do think that there will be some permanent changes um in the way that we look at art and the way that we buy art um, and I'm hoping that, that what it does is just create um, a more dynamic art scene, multiple different yeah. kinds of platforms for yeah. for um, for showing work and for buying work. Um, so, but yeah, I can't see that kind of physical experience of 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 of, of art, artwork, and exhibitions um, being replaced too easily. Um, mm -hmm. I think what this time has done, ideally, is just grow the base for looking mm -hmm. at art, showing us mm -hmm. different. And I, I, one of the, the nicest things that has come out of it, um, I think different galleries um, and different artists have found way, different ways of showing their work in lockdown, some to kind mm -hmm. of different degrees of success. And one of the nicest things that I've seen, I think it's um, on Goodman's website, Goodman Gallery, um, they, uh, they've developed these kind of audio tracks to go with there with the artwork so you you experience the artwork and then you have a curator um describing um many of whom are incredibly knowledgeable um telling you about the work and that for a lot of people is a wonderful experience and, and something that i hope will be carried on either into the gallery space or or online mm -hmm. um so yeah, yeah. That, that, 
that has been a real plus. There seems to be a connectedness now to the art world where shows are being presented in a much more accessible way. Mm -hmm. And often now the curators have, you know, gotten behind the video camera and they're explaining the show. And there seems to be this academic approach to art, which has come online, which is wonderful to hear, you know, the ins and outs of the, of the shows. But there is very little replacement for standing in front of a work and just moving into the color or walking around a work, a big sculptural work or something in 3D. So I, I you know, I do hope <laughs> to find myself back in a museum at one point. <laughs> Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> Thank you. That was interesting. Okay, great. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much for joining us today. And that was Thank a really good Thank you for hosting us. Yeah. yeah. What a pleasure. Thanks to all our listeners. And then we'll post this up on our website.